So this particular experiment, there uh, actually will be um, no uh, no module or anything like that. It's actually all the information that you need is in the lab manual in this experiment. And again, uh, we're doing the kinetics activity. The integrated rates method. And uh, in this experiment, uh, I think it's scheduled for today and Tuesday as well. So uh, a couple of dates is officially scheduled to do. And uh, everything that I think you will need, again, like I said, will be found in the lab manual. So uh, there won't be an individual sort of module for, for this or anything like that. Um, all the data and everything is actually in the actual experiment itself. So um, in the actual experiment, you'll see all the data tables and all that kind of stuff. And this is, uh, this is uh, an experiment where um, you will be making a lot of graphs. So we're gonna use a lot of graphs gonna be made in this experiment, not as many as they used to make. Um, so this was the experiment years ago. This is just for a few weeks, you would actually physically do the experiment and then you'd have to do like all these graphs and stuff like that. So there's still a good number of graphs, I think. Uh, I think almost maybe 20 some odd graphs maybe you're gonna make. Um, used to be 30-ish, I think. So. There's a lot of graphing that's gonna be done in this experiment, you're gonna use those graphs. And a couple of things here, the purpose of some of this uh, experiment <clears throat> is uh, to determine the order of a reaction. And we're gonna really determine that order of a reaction uh, based, on, based on graphs a lot of times. So when we're talking about that, if you remember, there's three types of orders that we sort of spoke about. We have our first order. And our first order uh, in terms of the graph, right, is the natural log of A versus time should yield you a straight line where the slope is equal to minus K. Uh, we also have our second order plot where you would graph one over A, the concentration of A, uh, times T, or divided by, not divided by T, on, uh, versus T. And that would also give you a straight line in a positive direction where our slope would equal K. And we also have zero order where if you make the graph that is the concentration of A versus time, that also should yield you a straight line. Again, um, this way where the slope is equal to minus K. So part of what you're going to do is you're gonna take a lot of the information that's given to you in these tables and you're going to essentially make all three of those plots for each of those sort of tables. Um, so you'll have time, you'll have the concentration, you're going to make these plots to figure out the order of the reactions. So these are going to be X, Y scatter plots. You're going to do a best fit line and get the equation the y equals mx plus b. And most importantly here as well, you are gonna to wanna to get the r squared value there when you add the tread line in Excel. Remember that the r squared value of one is the most linear. So that means when you make all three of these plots for each of the data that's present, you will then have to look at really the r squared value and the one that is closest to one would be the order because that would be the most linear plot and that will tell you the order. So for example, on the first set of data, if you plotted all three of these things and the R squared value for this guy was 0 0.999, the R squared value for this guy was 0 0.975 and the R squared value for this guy was 0 0.918, 
this one obviously being closest to one would be the order of the reaction. And you would say for that reactant, the order is going to be second order. So that's a major part of what you will be doing. So if we just kind of look through um, the data, there is, for example, system one. And in system one, you will see a table that says experiment one. You will see a table that says experiment two. And I believe you will see a table that says experiment three. And they're also at different temperatures. So for example, this one's at 325 Kelvin. Uh, the one above there is at uh, 315 Kelvin. And the one here is at 300 Kelvin. So what that means is, so let's just count graphs, shall we? You're going to make a first order plot a second order plot and a zero order plot, right? So that is three graphs. So for this table here, you should have three graphs. For the information in this table, you should have three graphs. And for the information in this table, you should have three graphs. So for system one, you should have nine total graphs at least properly labeled, tread lines, R squared values, equations just for system one there. In addition, you're going to make a 10th graph for this guy. And that 10th graph is going to be your Arrhenius plot. So you can make, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you're going to have to make your Arrhenius plot there. And that is why there is three different temperatures. So if you remember that plot is the natural log of K, one over the temperature in Kelvin in that particular case, using our equation that we talked about, which is the natural log of K is equal to minus E of A over R, one over T, plus the natural log of A. That's your Y is equal to MX plus B. Hence what we graphed on the X and what we graphed on the Y. This will give you a plot that looks something like this, where the slope of this is equal to minus E of A over R. And you're going to use this plot to eventually figure out the activation energy that's happening there. So for system one, you're going to have a grand total of something like 10 different plots in Excel, which again, like I said, all should be plotted correctly. And that's sort of the information you're going to kind of use for that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second. That also means when you roll to, I believe, System two, <clears throat> system two, you have a couple of tables that are present. And let me see here, just want to make sure. Yeah. So in uh, system two, you will see there experiment four at a temperature of 500 kelvin and you will see a table for experiment five at a temperature of 450 kelvin so the good news is for this guy just like the other one you will be making a plot of first order second order and zero order so that is three graphs for this guy for your first, second, and zero order. Same thing with this guy, you will be making three more graphs of first, second, and zero order. And you also have your temperatures here, but for this one, the good news is that's only six graphs. 
not too bad, I guess. So the good news is for the activation energy here, you're actually going to use the formula to calculate that. So that's our natural log of K2, K1 equals E of A over R, one over T1 minus one over T2. So for system two, they want you to find the activation energy through the actual formula and not, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not using a graph. So uh, that's one less graph at least that you have to make. And for system three, you have one table here. So for system three, you have experiment six at a temperature of 298. And you just got one table, which is good. So for this guy, you're going to make your three graphs here of your zero first and second order graph. So just quickly counting there, that's three graphs for that guy. That's six graphs for that guy. That's nine. That's something like 19 graphs that she has to make, which, you know, years ago, like I said, used to make 30. So that's a lot less than it used to be. And you had to do the experiment years ago as well in person. So that's not too bad. So you are going to make these different graphs. And the purpose of each of these sort of systems, as you can see, is first off, you're going to try to figure out the order with respect to the reactant that's there. Uh, you can also try to find out the activation energy, one through graphing, one through sort of calculation. Um, is sort of the uh, part of the goals here of this experiment. Now, there's something in this experiment that's a little bit different that you might uh, not necessarily understand. And that's the idea of we're going to try to figure out the, the rate constant for these guys. And there's something that's known as sometimes what is referred to as the pseudo rate constant and that comes up here so let's just talk about sort of that aspect of it let's kind of look at the example that they have in the introduction so in an introduction they have this reaction here a plus b goes to c and if we were to write the rate law for this the rate would equal k a to the x and b to the y now in order to determine the reaction order for A, uh, the concentration of B in their example was kept constant. Um, so what that means is when we start doing something with like a pseudo rate constant, um, what we can do is have just a large amount of a reactant or large concentration of a reactant that essentially it is in such excess that nothing really changes with it. So in this case, for example, I believe uh, they essentially kept B constant in their sort of example here. And what that means is since B is really not changing, what we are measuring is basically the rate with respect to just A. And when we do something like that, that is what is sometimes referred to as the pseudo rate constant. And the pseudo rate constant, again, is sort of a situation where we sort of focus in on one reactant only and we keep the other one, even though it's there, we keep the other one in such an excess amount that it essentially doesn't change. It has really no effect on the kinetics in that sort of state. It is just going to be really the other reactant. So in this case, essentially what we're doing is kind of making a like the limiting reagent. It's like the one that's going to be responsible for how fast the reaction and everything's going to happen. So in their example, they did this type of experiment. So essentially they um, figured out that they did a graph of the natural log versus time. And that was the one that was most linear. And they found that the order of a, was first order by doing that. So kind of like what you're doing, little graphs, you're gonna figure out the first order of that guy is going to be A through graphical sort of determination. Um, <clears throat> and it had a slope of, so when they did that graph, 
what they were saying in words there is they did this graph. They had that line. The slope equaled minus 45 reciprocal seconds in their example. Remember that the slope is equal to minus the K. And that means that the K value here would be 45 reciprocal seconds. And what that means is because we only really measured A in this case, this is truly not the real rate constant for this reaction. This is what they call the pseudo rate constant, which is why it has the little, little prime on it. So this would be the pseudo rate constant because of the way that they set up the experiment and they held the concentration of B pretty much constant. Any questions on that? So they could come up with sort of a rate law that the rate is equal to the pseudo rate constant times the concentration of A again to the first order is basically what they found. And when we think about that, <clears throat> we can basically uh, substitute in our number here, which was 45. And now, since we have a rate law that is basically based only on A, in reality though, this reaction is based on A and B. So we do need a way to basically figure out, you know, what the value of the true rate constant is. So we do have to take into account uh, the, the concentration of B that we have. So the overall rate will depend on B. And it's concentration. So in this particular case, uh, what we can do is that the rate constant will equal the pseudo rate constant divided by the concentration of B in this particular case. And that is a way that we can basically uh, solve for the actual rate constant. So when we kind of substitute this into here, we will end up with this expression. So ultimately the way that you can relate the pseudo rate constant to the actual real rate constant, it takes everybody into account, not just one reactant, but all the reactants is the rate constant will equal the pseudo rate constant divided by the concentration of the other reactant to its order. So that's the concentration of the other reactant to its order. So again, this value here that you get will come from your graph. And once you get that value, you would put it there, you would divide it by the other reactant and take it to its order. So just to give an example, if we look at, for example, let's look at system one real quick. So where is system one? There it is. So in system one, you are looking at this reaction. 2D plus E gives us F plus G. They use a lot of letters. Now the part of this problem, and when people always do this experiment, the thing that they never do is actually read. So I highly recommend you read. And what I highly recommend you read are the two lines that are right underneath that equation. And the two lines that are underneath that equation says the following data was obtained when the reaction run was done in the presence of excess E. So in this experiment, like we were talking about, they kept E pretty much constant and they really then just focused in on D. And it was found that E had a concentration of two molar, all right? And it was also previously found that E had an order of zero. So if you were to write the rate law for this guy, the rate is equal to K, 
d to the x and it would be e to the zero in this particular case. So what that means is when you do your graph, let's just say you did your graph and the natural log of a versus t was your winner there in terms of the r squared value. So if this was your winner in terms of the r squared value and it was the closest to one, not exactly one, but was sort of the closest to one, what that means is, <clears throat> excuse me, in this particular case, uh, what you would do is you would take the slope of it, which would equal minus k, and let's just say that equals positive 500, it won't. So it's just, I'm trying to use a number that's not gonna be the right number, so let me just go with positive 500 as the winner there. What that means is if I wanted to figure out what the true rate constant was, this number that I would take off of here, this number right here would be my pseudo rate constant. So basically my k to the minus one, or k to the one was equal to 500 seconds. That means that in this case, my real rate constant would equal my pseudo rate constant divided by my E to its order. And that means I would take 500 reciprocal seconds divided by my E, which was two molar to the zero. Two something to the zero is equal to one, which means in this particular case, my actual rate constant would actually be the same thing here because it was to the zero order. Let's just say that this was not the zero order, but they said, hey, it was found to be second order. What that would mean is I would take my pseudo rate constant times two to the squared, and that would give me 500 divided by four, uh, which gives you, was that 125, something like that, would be my actual rate constant. So when you look at each of these systems, you do not want to overlook the writing that comes underneath all those equations because underneath all those equations, it will tell you the concentration of the reagent that was held constant and it will also tell you the order of it. And then you're going to use the graphs that you make to figure out the order of the other reactant. And at that point, you will now have the rate constants. You'll have really the completed rate law with the orders of each reactant. And you can use those rate constants to do the graph uh, of the natural log of K versus one over T, or you could use it to plug into the actual formula to figure out the activation energy. So essentially the pseudo rate constant is a rate constant that you get when you do a reaction such as this, but you're essentially just looking at one of the reactants. So it basically is just the information about that one reactant. But in reality, the overall rate of that reaction is based on all the reactants that are present. So the way that you can basically correct that is to take your pseudo rate constant and divided by the concentration of the other reactant to its order. Question on how to go from pseudo rate constant, which is what you get from the graph, to actual rate constant by dividing it by the concentration of the other reactant to its order. Any questions on that there? Okay, so that's sort of the goal here. So let me just take a peek through here one more time just to make sure I think we hit everything. We are not going to, let me see here, pre-lab. So uh, you need to do obviously the pre-lab questions on this. Um, and again, they could be done anywhere, paper you want. Again, in the data part here, you do have uh, the three systems that we talked about with the tables. And again, uh, what we're up there, 19 graphs that you're going to have to make. You are going to have to turn in those 19 graphs. They do need to be properly labeled. You do need to show the, uh, the equation for the line and obviously the R squared value as that's what's going to help you um, determine what order it is. 
Uh, the data analysis should walk you through sort of the graphs and what you need to kind of get off of the graphs. So make sure that you do read the um, data analysis and make sure you calculate obviously whatever it asks you to calculate in the data analysis. And, and then in terms of the post op questions, let me take a look right here. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna let you know in the post lab if we're gonna do that. It has to do with mechanisms, so I'm gonna look it over just to verify. I'm on the fence. I don't know. Sometimes we do it. Sometimes we don't. So. I'll get back to you on the post lab part, which is the mechanism part, but the regular part of it should be enough to keep you busy. So uh, what you need to turn in is definitely pre-lab for sure. Uh, we're going to do just a data section here, which means you need to organize all your graphs into proper graphs that are labeled and again with the equations and all that type of stuff. In addition, in the data section, you need to make up some type tables that have the information that you determine. So you need to make sure you do all the data analysis and whatever they ask you to sort of figure out. And then you need to take that information and put it into an organized type table. Um, and then, like I said, I will let you know on the post lab. But so pre-lab questions you need to do. In terms of the report for this, you need just a data section. And again, no introduction, no results or discussion or anything like that. So just a data section where again, you should have all of your graphs, uh, obviously all labeled properly. Should also have uh, some sample calculations. Uh, you should also have some data tables. So whatever you think were important information, you should put those into tables. Um, yeah, you could type to pre-lab, I think. I don't know what, what's in the pre-lab there. If it's just questions and stuff like that, it should be fine. If you wanna type it, that's perfectly okay. And then I think we're gonna probably do some of the post-lab, so I'll let you know for sure, but I, I think we might do, do the post-lab. But again, uh, you could start working on the rest of it and I'll, I'll let you know for sure, because you can't really do it, I think, until you're done with all the rest of it anyways. Any questions on that? So officially it is scheduled for today. It is scheduled for Tuesday, so you have some time. And my guess is it will be due probably the following week after that. So I'll give you way more time than you need probably, but um, I think that will be sufficient. So essentially uh, you're gonna need to turn in all the tables, everything sort of organized. And like I said, uh, you do need to make some actual data tables of the important information like what was your activation energies? What was, you know, your rate? Okay, so like I said, uh, probably do a week from Tuesday. Since next Tuesday, we're officially still working on it. So that'll give you like a week to get it all together. So uh, between this one and the one that is due on this coming Tuesday, which is the previous experiment, I imagine you should have some stuff to keep you busy today for the rest of today. So make sure that again, you use this time wisely and you're working on these things. You definitely don't wanna be waiting to the very end because it's not gonna come out good for you. So if you do have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, if you like, I'll open up some rooms if you wanna kinda talk to some people and that type of stuff.